after the end of World War I, in November 1918, a peace conference was convened in Paris in early 1919. The Balfour Declaration, which had the full support of the Allied powers, was a pledge to facilitate the formation of a Jewish national home in Palestine. However, at the time, it was merely a political statement with no legal authority. Contrary to popular belief today, the Balfour Declaration also had support from Arab leaders at the time. In January 1919, Heim Weizmann, the leader of the Zionist organization, met with one of the sons of Sharif Hussein, the Emir Faisal of the Arab Kingdom of Hejaz. They were looking for each other's support in respect to their national aspirations. Their discussions resulted in the signing of an agreement, which is often overlooked. And there are several provisions in this agreement, which was signed on January 3, 1919, which make it clear that Palestine is supposed to be the territory for the Jews. In fact, the third article of that agreement specifically mentions the policy of the Balfour Declaration in respect to Palestine. There is no doubt that the spirit and the letter of this agreement relates to a Jewish home in Palestine and a very significant independent Arab state in other parts of the Ottoman Empire. This is Le Salon de l'Horloge, the room where the opening sessions of the Paris Peace Conference of 1919 took place at the French Foreign Ministry in Le Quai d'Orsay. Later sessions took place at the Palace of Versailles, which resulted in the Treaty of Versailles. That settlement, or treaty, became legally binding for the nations in Europe who had taken part in the First World War. Not only did the Paris Peace Conference deal with the European theatre, but also with the territories that had been ruled by the former Ottoman Empire. The Supreme Council of the principal Allied powers invited both Arab and Jewish representatives to present their territorial claims in this room. It was on February 6, 1919, that the Arab delegation presented its claim to the principal Allied powers in Paris. Interestingly, the British delegation was represented by Prime Minister Lord George and Lord Balfour, who was the Foreign Secretary. The representative, the Emir Faisal, specified where the Arabs wanted to establish independent Arab states. What's very important is to note that in describing the territory where the Arabs would have their autonomy and their independence, he left Palestine out. He refers to Palestine. So at this moment in February of 1919, he's complying with the commitments that he made in the agreement signed with Chaim Weizmann in early January of 1919. Having described where the new Arab states should be, he says this, Palestine for its universal character, he wants to leave to the side for the mutual consideration of all parties interested. So he's acknowledging that Palestine is not to be part of the new independent Arab states. Three weeks later, on the 27th of February, 1919, Heim Weizmann and the Zionist organization presented their claim when the Zionist organization presented its claim, it also specified the scope of the territory that they were asking for. They presented a map. It was a map of Palestine showing that all of the areas that were located west of the Jordan River should be part of, 
of the new Jewish state, or the new Jewish national home, and the part that was on the east side of the Jordan River. They were asking for areas that were all full of historical connections and biblical significance. And if you look at uh, the many maps that exist of the allocations and distribution of land to the 12 tribes of Israel, everything that was allotted to these 12 tribes was covered by these maps. But the area they were asking for stopped before the Ejaz Railway, which went from north to south, all the way to the boundaries of Arabia, because that was an important uh, and strategic railway for those who uh, attended pilgrimages in that part of the world. The Supreme Council of the Principal Allied Powers adjourned the consideration of future dispositions in the former Ottoman Empire until after the League of Nations had been constituted, which also happened at the Paris Peace Conference. At the end of the war, American President Woodrow Wilson had strongly opposed the idea of imperial and colonial expansionism resulting from victory. Previously, if a state in a legitimate war conquered another state, it had the right of annexation and generally did exercise that right of, right of annexation or set up some sort of colonial government but retained sovereignty to itself. Because of the pressure from, uh, from President Wilson, Britain and France could no longer claim to annex it. One of the things that not so well known about the mandate system is that it was essentially a compromise between the United States initially under Wilson, who believed that World War I should have brought the imperial age to a close. That was the American view, that it is the time of self-determination of peoples, that is the idea that Wilson introduced at the end of World War I, and therefore the imperial age should come to a close. This is a statue of Jan Christian Smuts, which stands opposite the Houses of Parliament in London. Smuts was a member of the War Cabinet that decided on the final wording of the Balfour Declaration on 31st of October, 1917. He was also one of the founding fathers of the League of Nations and a co-author of the Covenant of the League. The mandate system originated from Article 22 of the Covenant, which gave the mandatory powers a sacred trust of civilization to administer a people or a nation to a situation where they would be capable of both self-determination and self-government. The sacred trust of civilization means in this case, one country being entrusted with the um, administration of a nation that is not yet ready for self-government is a sacred trust, not just for that one nation, but a sacred trust of all civilization, meaning a, entrusted on behalf of the League of Nations and all of humanity.